the federal vaccine rollout has received a lot of criticism. How do you see it? What's your take on how getting the vaccine in arms in Nova Scotia is coming along with the plan by Dr. Strang and his team? Cody? I'll start. Uh, look, I think I, look, the Prime Minister has recognized this. When we came in, uh, when this pandemic happened, we didn't have the domestic capacity that we needed to be able to build the vaccines that were necessary. Uh, that's investments that we're making to be able to close that gap to make sure that in the future, if this happens again, we have the capacity. And, and that extends long before this government in terms of you know investment choices. I, I, I'm proud of our minister, Anita Anand, who's originally from Kentville, uh, of course, in my writing. So I need to, I need to recognize that. Uh, she did a tremendous job of being able to get a wide variety of different vaccines, you know, a different portfolio. So we have uh, six or seven different vaccine candidates. Of course, you know that by, by virtue of Pfizer, Moderna, uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, AstraZeneca and others. So we've done a very good job on that regard. Uh, I had a conversation yesterday with the Premier's office in this province. My understanding is that as a 30 year old, I'm the youngest member in caucus in the Liberal Party, I probably within four or five weeks will be able to have my first vaccine. I mean, that's the timeline because things are scaling up. Um, and so we, uh, and we knew that early on, the kind of curve goes like this, and then it just goes exponential. And so right now we have 2 million uh, doses of Pfizer arriving every week. That's just Pfizer. Uh, you know, we have Moderna shipments. There's other vaccines coming online. Uh, we had to build that capacity, but it's coming. I, I know it's difficult, but I, I expect uh, Dr. Strang saying by June, everyone who wants a vaccine will have at least the first shot. That is really important. And then we'll get the second shot. So I, I think we're, we're closing in. Uh, we did a lot to close the gap from where we were at the beginning of the pandemic. And the lessons learned on the other side, we're already implementing in the budget. We put two and a half billion dollars to focus on life sciences and, and vaccine uh, capacity. And when I look at my own writing, Pat, in Windsor, for example, with BioVector or Biomedica, those are local companies that can benefit from this type of investment. So we're supported. Anyway, I won't go on too much longer because I know you got more questions and we want to get Daryl in as well. And uh, I, I get my vaccine sometime this week. I'm supposed to anyway. So, all right. Yeah, well, I was going to say, you know, it's Spanish to be older, right? So, so uh, our buddy Cody's waiting. You're getting yours. And I had mine last week. Uh, so, you know, I feel good about that. Uh, what's important is that I said from the start, you know, we're the envy of the world. I can't say enough for Nova Scotia and Nova Scotians and keeping their distances, washing their hands, respecting the restriction and doing the right thing. I mean, it's amazing how well Nova Scotia came together. Uh, but, you know, we're ramping up. I mean, it's been a month now. We've really been ramping up. We're as Cody said, 2 million Pfizer coming in, there's Moderna coming in, Johnson & Johnson coming in now. But, you know, let's look at real numbers. We're at about 350,000 Nova Scotians have been vaccinated. That's 35%. That's pretty impressive right now. We've gotten over uh, 14 million vaccines in Canada. Again, we're at 30 plus percent, which is really, really good numbers. But where I want to touch quickly is how I want to thank companies across this country. Because our government, when we were caught in this, uh, this major crisis, think about it. We're looking for PPEs, we're looking for gloves, we're looking for, for our gowns, we're looking, looking, looking to the world to produce for us. And guess what? Everybody is looking and looking and looking, and we don't have enough. So right away, our government turned on a dime. We refocused here, and okay, we, we, we opened up to, to Canadian businesses. Can any one of you guys retool to make this happen and so we can produce our own products because we're in a world crisis? And boy, oh boy, thousands and thousands of companies across this great country came to the table and brought all their innovative ideas. And we've seen some in Stanfield over in Toronto. There's all kinds of companies in Nova Scotia and, and across the country that, that, that jumped in. That was very, very impressive. So that's what it's all about. It's government taking quick decision, risk uh, factors being put behind, using their own people to find solutions we're going to be able to build from this and we'll build our own manufacturing companies right here in Canada for the next time around as we move forward. Uh, now, uh, next question is, um, with not being able to get to Ottawa, how are you both faring with all these Zoom meetings? Well, I'm Zoomed out almost, eh? <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, it, it, it's, it, it's tough in one sense, but, you know, we're, we're getting the job done. We're probably being able to reach a lot more than we would because we're not traveling, you know, back and forth. Uh, so, so we can get to a lot more meetings. I think that's, to me, that, that's important as well. But we're, 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 I feel that I'm getting the job done. I'm still giving speeches in the house. I'm still working 40 plus hours on the Zoom with Parliament per week when we're in the house. We're in a long stretch here, five weeks straight, then one week constituency week, and then five more weeks straight. So that's 10 or 11 weeks. And, and you know, as you know, I'm on house duty right now. Uh, we're still, you know, we've learned a lot. We, you know, when, when you're in a crisis, uh, you start seeing gaps. And our government has been able to take advantage of the situation at hand and make improvements very, very quickly. Nobody thought that we could vote online, that we could vote for our phone, Pat. We've been talking about it since I've been in Ottawa in 2015. Like, what's wrong with us? We, you know, I got to run to the up the hill 10 times a day. Come on, let's vote for my office. And, and I have to say, you know, the conservative didn't want to do it. We, we, we got this technology working, they tested it and tested it. And some of them are even saying that, that some were doing on purpose so it wouldn't work. But by God, now it's been a month and we're voting online as, as Cody could say. And uh, two nights ago, or no, it was last Thursday, I think, I got up at three o'clock in the morning so I could vote at 3.15 in the morning. So you know what, we're getting the job done. We're doing what needs to be done to deliver for Canadians. You must have had lots of this. Uh... <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Any oh. uh, anything else to add to that, uh, Cody? Uh, look, uh, Daryl covered a lot. I, I, I think we're all. It's not the same as being there in person. Um, but Daryl hit on the head that we, first of all, we're very privileged to be able to have the opportunity to do our work in a virtual manner. We know that not all Canadians have that ability. Um, so I think it has been a good demonstration of the art of what's possible. As a new member of parliament that never had as much time as Daryl to spend in Ottawa, uh, I think it would have been nice to have a little bit more time to build relationships and get to see the inner workings. Uh, my hope on the other side of this is that uh, to the point Daryl made about being closer to the people you represent, if we can reduce the amount of times that we're in Ottawa, perhaps do some virtual elements that allows us to be better connected to our constituents. Those are the type of uh, uh, changes in the way that we run protocol that I think could be good. Um, but again, it doesn't replicate. There is a romantic uh, being in the House of Commons. Uh, I'm looking forward to once we can get through this pandemic and uh, and getting back to Ottawa. But we have been working hard, uh, despite the fact that it's uh, it's a little bit uh, unfortunate that it's all virtual. But uh, but it, there are some silver linings, as Daryl mentioned. All right. Um, and speaking on that, uh, would you guys be up for once a month video interviews with us to talk federal politics and update the community on what you're up to. Absolutely. No, and, and, and Daryl Daryl mentions this, Pat, but uh, of course, uh, you have deep connections in, in Hance County and in East Hance particular, you know, uh, through formerly the Weekly Press. And, and, and thanks for the work that you do around local journalism, because Daryl hit it right on the head. We need people to be able to tell local stories and get information out and information share. Hold us to account. It's great, you know, that you can come on and and uh, I don't want to speak for Daryl, but I suspect he'd be happy to jump in and, you know, whether or not you want to do us together or have a separate, whatever, um, I'm all yours whenever you need me. Uh, same here, Pat. Uh, absolutely. And two, as you know, every week since uh, March 13, 2020, I've been on two radio stations, Seaside FM and here 97.5 in Sackville. Uh, I know that your constituents uh, hears uh, those interview. I've done them weekly before for the first four years. I used to do it uh, only when we were in Ottawa. So it was, you know, the MP report from Ottawa. But since the pandemic started, it's been weekly so that I could make sure that my constituents and surrounding areas got the day-to-day -day or the weekly, I should say, uh, uh, key points that were being happening in Ottawa and sharing that with Canadians and my constituents.